her solo album, which was called And Yet, as yet untitled and released around 10 years ago. It wasn't really a snapshot of you in a particular moment in time because it was written over the space of uh, over many years. So can you tell me more about the gestation period of that album? Well, I always write songs and, and a, a couple of these songs on the album were written uh, as far back as 1993, 90, 93, 94. Um, and I just, I was always writing, but then I landed a job with, um, with Rainbow and I never really had time to, I did Rainbow and Ingrid Malmsteen sort of, not quite back to back, but almost. And I never really had time to go in and record a solo album. So when I left Ingvi's band, um, I gathered some friends together and just asked them if they would help me out. And everybody to a man said, yeah. And uh, so we recorded it. It took me another two years to get a deal. <laughs> but uh, but I, 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 I managed to secure a deal for it as well. Um. But it, it, it got no recognition at all. I mean, the recognition it's getting now and, and, and the, the amount of people who didn't know it was there uh, and the amount of people that have shown an interest in it. Has, I am one of them. In fact, for me, it's not a re-release, it's a release because I had missed it the first time around. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think almost everybody did. And I think that the, the, this, new, this new record label that decided to, to put it out has done a great job. It's a great package for anybody that has it yeah. because it's too, it's been remastered. It's got extra bonus tracks. Plus, it has an extra bonus CD, which is uh, which I yeah, watched. I was going to yeah. talk about that. Uh, yeah. so it's great. I'm very pleased. Excellent. Um, in fact, if I'm getting the chronology right, you wrote it while you were with Tank, right? Um, no, uh, it was recorded. It was it was recorded before. Tank. Uh, and the reason I got the job in Tank was because I had Mick Tucker, who was, who was one of the guitarists in Tank. He wrote, wrote two songs on the album for, with me. And, um, and, and he said, oh, we're thinking of doing a Tank album and we've got some gigs. Do you fancy joining Tank? And I said, OK. So, so Mick contributed two songs to the, to, to the album. One of them, which is a bonus track called The Edition of Dirt. One of my favourite tracks of this, this album is the opening track, Come Taste the Bend. Um, I believe it went back quite a few years before the album came out. So um, can you just um, describe the circumstances around which this song was written? It's quite well, a lively I a song. I got a phone call from Richie Blackmore um, on a Saturday night. Uh, sometime in April 1994 and um, he wanted me to come over to uh, uh, audition for Rainbow and he said but I'd like to I'd like to see a new photograph of you because I I haven't seen anything or heard anything from you for about three years so on the Monday morning my friend Alex Dixon and I went in and we record we wrote and recorded two songs both of them appear on this CD. One was Come Taste the Band, which at that time was the only Deep Purple album Richie hadn't played on. And, yeah. and so we thought it would be funny to do it in a Mark IV style Deep Purple with Alex playing like Tommy Bolan. And I did the David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes parts. Uh, when it came to actually recording the album, um, I had my friend Patty Russo uh, do the what would be the Glenn Hughes parts if it was a purple song. Um, Patty sang with Meatloaf for 14 years. She was the Paradise by the Dashboard Light Girl, among other things, with Meatloaf. And just to add the icing onto the cake, uh, I contacted Tony Carey. Now, Tony was on the Rainbow Rising album, mm -hmm. and he was the keyboard player on that. And I asked Tony if he would give me something similar to start off the album. And then, I, then and he did, and then that kind of got that sort of purple rainbow family um, song out of the way, and all the chains were off then. Yeah, have you ever played these songs live? Because they, no. they, they felt like really perfect to galvanize a crowd, this, a lot of the songs. 
Yeah. No, they were they've ne they've never they were never played live. They were ne they were all recorded in different in different places. Um, uh, the drums were recorded in Miami and Stockholm. Some of the guitars were recorded in Stockholm and, and in London. Bass was recorded in America as well. Um, no, so it, and, and it was a it was a mate of mine, a guy called Pontus Norgren. Now, Pontus is the guitar player with Hammerfall. Hammerfall, yeah. Right, and 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 I'd known Pontus from my from my very first days with Ingve, uh, and and he's a great engineer and a great producer, and uh, so he just took all the parts that came in from all over the world and put it together into the album. Yes, you mentioned the fact the the main CD of the re-release has a couple of bonus tracks. Are those yeah. recent compositions or were they? No, uh, no. They, they were two songs that I just decided not to put on the album. Um, they, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't quite remember the reason. But I thought that I thought that the ten songs or eleven songs that were on the original album were enough. And we had, and I always like to over-record just in case something doesn't work. So I held back, um, I held back dishing the dirt, um, and I held back small town Saturday night. Which is actually the oldest song of them all. That was written. That was written um, in in the ninety one or ninety two, um, and the original demo was it was so it was so gentle and so so beautiful, um, but we had to rock it up a bit to put it on the album. But it's still a very beautiful song, and it's just a, it's just a reflection of um, a rock club that my friends and I used to go to in their hometown in Scotland. Uh, and I, I really love that song, uh, Small Town Saturday Night. Then my favorite songs are the fastest one and the slowest one. Right. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's it's a lovely song, and it just tells just tells a grown up in a small town and wanting to leave. Yeah. So um, as we said, as as yet untitled, the release has a has a bonus CD, yeah. which features cover versions that you've recorded over the years, right? Yeah. It would. It was a it was a whole bunch of us got together in 1999 and 2000, and we recorded tribute albums to different people. They were very tribute albums were very popular at that time. Uh, yeah. um, Amer the Americans did their version, the Brits did their version, the Europeans did their versions, and I would get a phone call on a Monday morning saying we're going to do a Nazareth tribute or we're going to do a White Snake tribute. Can you learn these three songs? So I didn't even get to choose the songs. I just was told what to learn, went in on the Friday at lunchtime and was out by dinner time. You know, about four hours later, it was all recorded and in the bag. And 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 it's quite funny, actually, because l listening through to the CD, there are songs on here I don't even remember having recorded. Because we did so many and, you know, every week it was something different. Every week it was something different. And, and uh, so I don't remember doing Twisting the Night Away or Not Fade Away or Emerald or uh, what else was there? Let's Spend the Night Together. I mean, I have no memory of doing them at all. So it was quite interesting to hear them. <laughs> so and two of the songs uh, in this bonus today are covers of The Clairvoyant and Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter of I Maiden. And yeah. um, were they these two songs... Um, two of the songs you had sung when you auditioned for I Maiden to replace Bruce. Um, no, I don't think they were. No, I don't. No, I don't think they were. No, no, it was it, it, a lot. Of, a lot of the material that I that I auditioned with was from uh, a real live one and okay. a real dead one. You know, so so there was so I, so we were doing. Um, I can't remember actually. What it was. I mean, we did the classics, of course, Fear of the Dark yeah. and, and and those kind of things. Uh, another uh, cover is UFOs Too Hot to Handle. I'm, I'm wondering if Michael Schenker heard that song. When... I wouldn't I wouldn't th I wouldn't think so. Uh, if he had, he would have called me earlier. <laughs> One of the musicians to help you, you mentioned there are quite a few friends who helped yeah. you out in the solo album. One of them is the bassist Neil Murray, who played yes. with Black Sabbath, White Snake, and God knows how many other bands. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that I heard you and Neil were writing material for a Cozy Powell solo album before he died. Is there is that true? And um, what happened to those songs? Well, 
Um, after I'd auditioned for Maiden, somebody recommended me to uh, a guy called Mike Caswell. And Mike's a guitar player, and he was writing an album with Cozy and Neil, which ended up being Cozy's last solo album. Um, and I wasn't involved in any of the writing. Uh, I did some demos with them. And then, of course, I landed the Rainbow gig, and that kind of just put an end to that. Oh, that was um, before the Rainbow gig. It was just before. Cozy was, at, Cozy was actually the second person. I phoned my brother first to tell him I'd got the gig with Richie. And Cozy was the second one, second person I called, because we had we were going we were arranging to go into the studio to start work, and uh, so he eventually ended up using uh, a great American singer called John West. Uh, yes, I I, um, I know who he is. Yes, and jo and John John was in Royal Hunt for a while. Indeed, um, exactly. uh, and he he also he also sang with Ingve for about three days and he just him and Ingvi didn't hit it off and I was kind of drafted in sort of shortly after that Okay, um, you, you've also recently been, um, you've joined Alcatraz and what, what, I was wondering what was your reaction on being asked to join Alcatraz, especially considering that Graham Bonnet was a friend of yours Graham Bonnet is still a friend of mine um, Well the truth of the matter is Alcatraz were touring over here in the UK and um, they were playing in Edinburgh and I got a phone call uh, that Graham wanted to go for a coffee and have a, you know, have a wander around the city. And he just told me he didn't like this music. I don't want to do this music anymore. I don't like it. I didn't like it when I was doing it with Vi. I didn't like it when I was doing it with Ingve. And I'm not enjoying it now. And I, and I said to him, I said, well, why don't you? Because he had the Graham Bonnet band running sort of side by side with it. And the last two Graham Bonnet albums were great. And I said to him, well, why don't you just do the Graham Bonnet band then? If you don't want to do this, you know, you're still singing great. You look great. You know, you're a legend. Why don't you just go and do that? Um, and I was just finishing off the first of three albums that I have to do for Frontiers Records. Um, the project's called Long Shadows Dawn. I was just finishing that off. Um, and I got a phone call from the Alcatraz guy saying that Graham had actually quit the band and would I like to do the tour dates? And I said, well, hmm, you know, I'm not going out to be part of a Graham Bonnet tribute band. You know, if we're going to do it, let's write an album together because there were no tour dates anyway because of the pandemic. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we took we took a few months and we wrote and we wrote an album and, and, and we're very pleased with it. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's under embargo. I'm not allowed to talk about the album. I'm not no, allowed to talk about the songs. Not, 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 not until, not until I think August or the middle of August. I mean, I can tell you that it's brilliant, and I can tell you that um, you know it's got lots of shredding and some beautiful guitar playing from Joe Stump. I can tell you that the 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 the, the bass and drums are thunderous, and that the keyboards are an orchestra in the background. But that's all I can tell you. Is Turn of the Wheel a good indication of what to expect? Yeah. Turn of the, yeah. That that we chose that as the as the first release because it was out of the metal madness that is the new Alcatraz album. That was one that was that just stood out. It's got a great chorus, it's 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 concise, it's to the point, it's got a good message. Uh, yeah. and, and and we just liked it. And it's got a great solo as well. And we just liked it. We thought that one's going to work. It's, it's a great song. I absolutely agree. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, a few months earlier this year, I interviewed Gary Shea. I hope All right. I'm pronouncing his surname right. Um, and he hinted at Manstein's, you know, sense of humor. And is that something you, you could witness when you sang with him? Because you, sometimes he comes across as, Really, a serious person, Manstein. He's very serious about his music, mm -hmm. but I I was with Ingvi for nearly seven years, and I enjoyed my time very much with him. Um, I when I went in, I knew what my role was, and my role was just to be the singer in the band. It wasn't to write the songs with him, and and we we always had good fun together, Ingvi and I. You know, whether 
whether it was going around and and uh, and driving around in the Ferrari or whether it was playing tennis or whether it was recall, whatever it was, it was always great fun. But as all these great guitar players do, in my experience, is that they like to change the lineup of their band because that keeps the creativity juices going. You know, they, 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 they think that by changing the band, and, and first to go is always the singer. You know, yeah. when I joined Ingvi's band, he said, I think you'll really enjoy this. We're going for a cross between Queen and uh, Iron Maiden. And I was like, okay. When I, when I left the band, he said, mm, I don't think you're going to like the direction I'm going in. It's going to be more Queen and Iron Maiden. <laughs> you know, so, it's, so it was two bookends, you know. But it's the same, you know, it's the same with working with everybody like that. Yeah, um, I don't know if I, I can ask you this. Um, had you, how much more of a role did you have in writing the songs with Alcatraz? I, I, I wrote, I wrote um, almost all the melodies and lyrics. Okay. Almost all. For, for I think there's, I contributed to every single one of them. I wrote, and I think... With the exception of two, I wrote all the melodies and all the lyrics for Alcatraz. I just get I get given a piece of music, uh -huh. and then it's up for it's up to me to find something to do with those pieces of music. From your point of view, um, how are Ingwi Manstein, Michael Schenker, and Richie Blackmore different from each other, both as persons as and as guitarists? Well, uh, as guitarists, they're ve they're, they're they're very different. Um, my, Michael, Michael's the one who's the most disciplined. Well, he's the one who disciplines his band the most because um, Envy and Richie are very much free spirits when it comes to live performance. Michael, Michael likes, Michael likes like an ACDC show or an Iron Maiden show where it starts and finishes at exactly the same time. With Ingvi and, and, and Richie, you never knew when it was going to go off this way or when it was going to go off that way. And you would just get a pointy finger coming at you and that would tell you when you came back in. So working after having worked with Richie and Ingvi for so long, working with Michael was a good discipline for me because if the riff only went round two times before I came in singing, it only came round two times before before I came in singing. With Richie, it could go round as many times as it wanted if I was doing something with the audience. And uh, so it was, mu it was much more disciplined. What did you um, learn from your time with Blackmore that helped you in the rest of your career? If you can mention uh, one thing, let's say. That never to take an audience uh, for granted. Mm -hmm. Never take your audience for granted. Know your lines when you go on stage and give the best performance as if it's going to be the last show you'll ever play. I haven't heard, I haven't heard anything from Envy since I left the band. I always find that kind of a bit odd that you would go back and listen to a, a band that you were in with the, with the new singer or whatever, it's a bit like spying on your old girlfriend. You know, it it brings up it brings up different emotions. It's not something that interests me. Yeah, you know, a curious observation is that when as uh, back to your solo album is that when as yet untitled was originally released in the space of five months, you released three albums. There was the solo album, an album with Demon's Eye, and an album with La Paz. Now, when the these space of a few months you have your real release of your solo album the album with Alcatraz and you mentioned one album with Long Shadows Dawn I mean yeah. don't you get any rest or don't you well these things just happen um the the the, the, the solo the solo album initially was ready to go it was recorded two years before it was released um and I don't I, I couldn't tell you about about the La Paz and the Demon's Eye albums I don't know. It's it's a long time and a long and a few albums ago, but with this one, um, the record company approached me about releasing the solo, re-releasing the solo album. So I did that. Um, 
Frontiers and I had been dancing around each other for a number of years, but we but it wasn't until they put me in touch with Emil Norberg, who's my writing partner in Long Shadows Dawn, um, that I, that I thought I can work with this guy, and I can work with this record company, um, and that's what we did. I had no idea that um, Alcatraz were going to contact me. Fact, you know, I had no idea. Yesterday, I was speaking to an old bandmate of yours, Chris, Chris Dale. He also told oh, me right. you contributed to another album, Dan Bond's Lost Sanctuary, he told me. What was it called? Um, Dan Bond's Lost Sanctuary. You said... He yes, I, yes, oh yes, I did, yes, I did. I did, yeah, I did, yeah. No, that was great, because that was a, di that was a different, uh, that was very different. He wrote the song. So, it, it, so it's always a good discipline for me to sing a song someone else has written because when, when someone gives you a song, I try to stick very much to what they give me. And then if they say, oh, can you expand on it? Mm -hmm. Then I expand on it a bit. But yeah, working with Dan was great fun, you know, he, and, and, and it's a good song. I like it. His album's really good. Yeah, it sounds it sounds sounds good. I've heard uh, just one track. So, Dougie, would you have um, any plans to do another solo album in the near future if you had the time? You know, a, a total totally new. I'm, I'm well, sure you'll find friends who'll be willing to help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I've got. I always I always treat every album I do as if it's my own album anyway. You know, because I'm contributing the melodies and the lyrics and I want it to be as best as it can be. And I always try to stamp my own personality on anything that I do. With regards to another solo album, if I'm going to do another one, do you know what I liked? I liked what Miles Kennedy did. You know, he's 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 a brilliant singer and a brilliant writer now. And, and I liked the way he just stripped it all back. Still rock songs, but he did it in an acoustic fashion. And I liked that. And I... And I'm sitting here with about 30 um, sort of piano or acoustic songs that are just very, very basic. Mm -hmm. But they have, but they've got great melodies and great lyrics. And it would be working with a producer and, and some musicians that we could put this together and make something that would that would not just be another rock album or a heavy rock album or a metal album, whatever label anybody sticks on it. Just something slightly different where I could relax, you know. So yes, that would that would be if that would be my choice because I get all my I get all my aggression, all my passion, and all my uh, inner inner monster out when I'm doing the rock albums. If I wanted to do something just for myself. And and for anybody else that would be interested, that's that's what I would be doing. I would do I would do a piano and acoustic, you know, with cellos and violins and you know something just different. But I'd need to I'd need to have a producer who would be prepared to work with me with that. I've got the songs. You you do have ideas in your head for songs? No, I have no, I have the songs demoed. Okay, it's oh yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I've got all this all this all the songs are demoed, but it's. Ronnie Dio once said to me, look, you, it, in, this, in this particular genre, it's very difficult to step out of the box. Mm -hmm. You know, David Bowie could do it because he was David Bowie. Peter B Gabriel could do it with, because he was Peter Gabriel. I'm just Doogie White. I don't know if anybody would be remotely interested, you know. But, you know, if I have enough time and uh, we'll, we'll see. So the last thing I want to ask, you know, in the... In this as yet untitled album, there is a song called "Dishing the Dirt," which where you sing the verse, "It's good to be back." Um, in a world still recovering from the pandemic, um, how accurate are those words now that you rescheduled to play live again? Yeah, well, let's see, shall we? I mean, it's yeah, not. It's it's true, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's still, you know, it's still it's over here in the UK at least. It's still not. It's still not a going concern. You know, they're quite happy to open up the Wimbledon and Wembley and uh, Silverstone for the Grand Prix, where, you know, where tens of thousands of people are all mixing. 
together. But gigs, no, but, gigs but they are... won't let. But the gigs are the gigs won't happen. Absolutely. Now, they can they can they can open up um they can open up the the big venues, Earl's Court, right? Yeah. And you can stick five thousand people in there, but it holds fifteen or twenty. But what do you do in a club that holds a thousand? Do you yeah. stick two hundred people in or sixty people in? I mean, I, it's wiser men than me will make these decisions. I just can't wait to get back and play live again. It's been a long, long time. This is the longest I haven't sung live since 1988. Probably yeah. since 1984, actually. Oh, it's, cra it's crazy. It's crazy. It's you know? Really yeah. And, and, and fans are, are itching to go to, get to gigs. I, I, the same from the other side of the stage, too. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, with a singer, and I suppose with drummers as well, but with a singer, you're, you're kind of, it, it's kind of athletic. You have to be in, in good shape for it. And but singing in singing in the house mm. in preparation for a live gig is a bit like playing tennis in your bedroom. It, you know, you might be hitting the ball against the wall, but it's you're not really getting the reaction that you need. And so I need to I need to sort of uh, up my game a bit and maybe find a rehearsal hall where I can go in and play the songs and and start opening it up because I mean I'm singing a, a little bit every day, but I need to open it up and just. Be be ready. Should should the um, should the curtains open, I should be ready to uh, be back on stage again. Fantastic, Doug. It's been a really interesting conversation. Thank you for your time in doing this. And honestly, best luck for all you have planned. I hope to see you live very soon. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it very much. Thanks a lot, man. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.